one of the leading uh, urban entomology labs in the country, um, and she's doing her work on med bugs for the past couple of years. So if uh, we give uh, Brittany a round of applause, and I'm going to hand off the mic to her. All right, thank you, and thank you, Ben, for that kind introduction. I am doing my PhD work with bed bugs, and I am in the same lab as Ben actually graduated from. Must have been two years now? Ben's yeah. gone for a little while. And so we're going to have a little bit of fun here with my section. Molly did a great job kind of introducing this subject and talking about these different treatments we can use for bed bug control. So Molly did a great introduction, and I'm not going to go through and cover everything she discussed as far as why you would implement these certain programs. Um, and I'm also not going to give an introduction to bed bugs. Ben did a great job with that earlier. But I'm just going to quiz you guys really quick before we move on. What does a bed bug eat? Blood. Blood. Perfect. And about how long, if a bed bug gets a regular blood meal, how long will it live? A year. A year. I mean, y'all are experts. You didn't need me to get up here and do this again. Um, trying to think. How many legs do they have? Are they flat or round? Yeah. All right, awesome. Yeah, I didn't need to cover any of that bed bug biology. You're doing a great job. I will talk a little bit about why we um, are having a problem again with bed bugs here in the United States. So we have seen a resurgence. This occurred about in the 1990s and has continued to be a problem up through the 2000s. And just as Molly already discussed, bed bug numbers are not really decreasing here in the United States. They continue to only increase, and that's what a lot of our surveys actually are continuing to say as well. And if you talk to just about any pest control company, they're saying that they continue to have an increase in bed bug problems. And the reason why this occurred is primarily because of these um, four different bullet points I have up here. So one of the problems we had is just people moving around with international travel. And so we had eradicated bed bugs out of the United States, but that wasn't the case all across the world. So in poorer countries, third world countries, they were still having a problem with bed bugs. And so you know you can hop on a plane and essentially be across the country within a day. And what was happening is where these bed bugs were so prevalent and present, uh, people were traveling to those areas and they brought bed bugs back here to the United States. And another probably even bigger factor here is just the change in pest control practices here in the United States. And so what did we used to do as far as pest control? Say in the 1970s, 80s? DDT of course was a, a great product. It worked very well. Bed bugs did develop resistance to DDT. Um, so we would go in and instead of applying or like we would just quarterly do these pest control um, practices where we would just go in and spray baseboards and it wasn't really a targeted pest control practice. Now we're more targeted and we're not going to go in and just spray unless we see the presence of pests. And so that change in pest control practices has probably impacted our bed bug control because we don't have, first of all, the products that work as well and we're not applying them as much as we used to. And another problem we have is the movement of furniture and thrift store furniture. So that's why it's very important. We ask people if they do have, like, remove their items, put them outside, and they do have a bed bug problem with a mattress or a couch. We ask them to try to either rip up the furniture or put a note on it, maybe spray paint bed bugs. Uh, so people, that limits people moving in these items that could be potentially infested with bed bugs. And what I feel is probably the most important factor up here is going to be the increased pressure of resistant populations. So Molly covered this a little bit. A lot of the products we have out there for bed bug control, even your, your combined products with a pyrethroid and a neonicotinoid, both of those products have been shown to, um, in bed bugs, have shown, they have shown to be really resistant to a lot of those products that we actually have for our bed bug control. And here I know there's a lot of people here that work for, for um, public housing. And so if you look at HUD documents, 
One of the big things that they say, as far as bed bug control that they want to implement and should be occurring, is prevention. So here it says they want bed bugs to be prevented from occurring in the first place. So, so not only is the goal to eradicate, eradicate and essentially kill all the bed bugs, we also want to try to prevent them from moving from apartment to apartment and even getting into these homes and these apartments in the first place. So how are you going to do that? Does anyone have a prevention program in place? Molly discussed a lot of different um, control strategies earlier that could be used for, for prevention. I'm giving it away by my title. So uh, what you can do as far as prevention, also Ben, ben discussed it with his traps, is going to be monitoring is going to be your big thing. You want to monitor. So you do that with these interceptor traps that he discussed earlier. Mattress encasements are also another um, a great tool for trying to prevent bed bugs. And then I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the containerized heat treatments that we're going to get to get up and actually build here in a minute. And they can also be used as a preventative measure. Molly discussed this, uh, where she was using these, these containerized bed bug, like blow up houses and stuff, for actually treating those items. So people that have had a bed bug infestation before they actually move into an apartment or building are actually having their items treated. So if there are bed bugs, they're essentially killing all those bed bugs before they even move into the house. And so I'm going to be talking about a do-it-yourself method. So I think Molly was saying some of the heat boxes she was looking at were anywhere from 5000 to upwards of a few more thousand in, in the price. So they're a great tool to have. But I'm going to teach you guys today how to actually build your own heat box. It's going to be a lot more cost-effective. And so this was a, uh, a heat box container, containerized heat treatment that was developed at the University of Florida. And I have some prices up here. Some of these prices may be a little outdated. But these are all items that you can buy at your local um, like Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart. And you can see here, compare this to $5,000. Here, all the items I have listed here are total to about $237. So much, much more cheaper than the other items that you can buy commercially. And so what you're going to need is polystyrene styrofoam boards. And to build the entire box, we're going to build a mini version today. But the entire box is about 8 by 8 feet and 4 feet high. So we're going we're gonna to build a mini version, but I know everyone always asks me, you can't fit a couch a large bed and a lot of items into a box that's that big. So you'll need the, the foam boards to build the outside of the box. And then of course, in order to heat it up, um, we use oil-filled heaters. Something you want to check, it wasn't a problem a few years ago when, when we first started doing this, but some of the heaters will reach a certain temperature and then they just cut off. So you want to try to check and make sure there's not a cutoff temperature um, that won't go past that 120, 122 degrees that you need to kill the eggs in all life stages of bed bugs. And then of course you'll also need fans in order to circulate that heat and try to basically make the box into a convection oven. And then most importantly is that you're going to need those thermometers to monitor the heat and make sure items that you would expect to be really difficult to treat, um, say you have a a dresser drawer that's packed with items. I wouldn't, um, you know, I wouldn't leave that, that door closed. I would try to open up that drawer and actually aerate, move the items around. But you want to have at least a couple of thermometers. If not more, you can use as many as you want to to make sure you get that temperature up to actually kill all of those bed bugs. And so here I just have a picture that's basically showing you how to build the box. Like I said, we're, we're going to do it, so you're going to get real, real experience today. So this is the polystyrene boards here that you would use to build the box. So getting started, you would just want to use um, two of the, the, the styrofoam boards here, and you want to build just one side of the box. And then you would bring all the items in. So here in the middle, you could put a bed, multiple pieces of furniture, whatever you need that's going to be in that apartment or that room. Um, you obviously want to make sure you don't want to pack it completely and everything has room for airflow to get through. And then you would put your two heaters here in opposite corners and then put the fans behind the heaters so the heat can actually circulate around and create that convection oven and, and actually kill all the bed bugs in these items. 
So here's an actual picture, so you can see what this box looks like once it's been packed and once it's been built. And I didn't bring these items today, but you can see here, oftentimes, and depending on what kind of floor you have, if you have a tile floor or a concrete floor, you're really going to have a hard time getting that temperature up because those are going to be heat sinks, and they're going to create, or the heat's going to go into those, um, those floors instead of actually um, heating the box and heating up those items to kill all the bed bugs. So if that's a problem, depending on what floor type you have, what we typically do is we just buy a kid's play mat, play mat. So this is just a foam mat, the same size, 8x8, eight eight, that, cre that creates the bottom to try to prevent that heat sink. And then um, for this particular box, they went ahead and put all the items here from one of the dorm rooms. So you can see that they were able to fit an entire bed. I think this was either a full or a queen size bed. There were two different couches. And... Um, here I believe there was a dresser drawer. So several items that were in the dorm room they went ahead and put on top of the foam mat before they started to build the box. And here, the, you can see here they're starting to build the box. So they put the two um, sides here up like I was discussing earlier and they went ahead and put their fans in. Something important when we start to build this that you'll want to remember is your fans and your heaters will have a cord. So you want to make sure that you put that cord underneath the, sty the styrofoam board so you can actually plug it in once you build your entire box. Every mistake you can make I've already made, so, so remember these things. And then next thing you're going to do, step three, is you're just going to continue to build the box, put up the next two sides, and then the other two uh, pieces of foam board are actually going to go on top, and then you just seal everything up with uh, duct tape. We use masking tape. Duct tape, of course, is a little bit better. It holds everything together, um, better together. But it's a real pain in the butt to try to rip that off later, and it's going to mess up your foam board. So we learned that the hard way, too. So I would recommend that you use masking tape because it comes off way easier. And then, just like the, the cords here that you're going to need to plug in, uh, with your thermometers, you want to use indoor-outdoor thermometers. We use the ones with wires. You can buy wireless ones, but sometimes they kind of interact with each other. And so we bought the ones with wires. So you want to leave, of course, the end of the wire that has the sensor on the inside of the box in areas where you would expect the heat not to be able to penetrate really easily. So put those wires inside the box and then, um, of course, leave your thermometer on the outside so you can monitor those temperatures. And of course, it's really important, Molly discussed this already, um, to monitor those temperatures. You're not gonna be able to just set up the box and leave it. You need to check the monitors and make sure you have the temperature up um, and check them in regular intervals. And so it's just like the same thing. I know we're all gonna have turkey here in a few months. And if you have a small turkey, it's obviously gonna cook a lot faster than a larger turkey. So you would use a thermometer to make sure your turkey is completely cooked. The exact same thing, the same principle applies to this heat box. Again, you want to use those thermometers, use at least a couple, use as many as you need to, to make sure that all those items get up to about 120 degrees Fahrenheit and stay at that temperature for about an hour um, before you break the box down and take the items out. So here, this is just a graph showing um, we had about nine different monitors in this particular box just to see if we could kill all the bed bugs within the box. And so here you can see this is the temperature and the amount of time, the entire treatment time was over five hours. And once the temperatures reached about 48, 50 degrees Celsius, that's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the lethal zone. You can see that um, different items depending on what they were, were much more difficult to get up to that lethal temperature. So here we had a Chester drawer that um, was not in blankets. So we had put blankets in this box. And so this one was outside the blankets, just kind of open. Of course, it reached that lethal zone way more quickly than, look, if you look at this blue line, this was a Chester drawer wrapped in blankets. And Molly already discussed with your clothing items, if you have a laundry basket, that's going to be some of the hardest items to actually get that temperature up to where you need it to be. So here you can see yellow line outside the blankets reached lethal temperature within about um, three hours. 
compared to this Chester drawer, which didn't reach the lethal temperature for about another hour, hour and a half. So it's really important that you use those monitors and you stuff them into places where you think you're going to have a, have a hard time getting that temperature to reach the lethal zone. And then I know several of you actually work with pest control companies where you have a license to do pest control. Your maintenance person is doing pest control for public housing here. And so another option is you can actually build these boxes within an apartment or within um, an actual room. And so if you do build the box and you're able to get most of the items into this, this heat box while you're waiting for it to get up to temperature and you're monitoring those temperatures, another thing you can do for any bed bugs that could be you know, hiding behind your baseboards or hiding in other areas within the room is apply a residual insecticide. So here we went ahead and built the box in the middle of the room and while we were waiting on that box would get up to temperature. We went ahead and pulled back the carpeting, got behind the baseboards, and they, um, this gentleman actually applied a residual insecticide to get any of those bed bugs that could be hiding elsewhere. And we did implement this into a women's shelter. Uh, they didn't actually have the money to, to pay for pest control. They couldn't pay for an actual heat treatment. And so they asked us to come out and build this box. And they paid for all the items of the box. And then the thought was, it's, okay, we'll train you how to use the box, and then the box is yours, and this is how you can try to prevent bringing bed bugs into the shelter and try to get those bed bug infestations under control. So this was in Madison, Virginia, while I was at Virginia Tech with Molly. You can see Molly here. Molly gets Max, I put her butt in all the presentations. <laughs> and um, the ultimate question that I also answered is, can three blondes actually build a heat box and, and make it effective? So I will tell you the answer to that question very soon. So here we are building the box. You can see, I forget what this floor was, maybe it's linoleum, but you know, concrete underneath. So we went ahead and decided to put down that play mat here. So here's Molly and I um, actually construction, constructed the box and put down the play mat. And um, here, we. this was just from one room, there was a couch, I believe maybe this is a, a bed frame, a lot of different items, we had stuffed animals, a lot of stuff in here. We were able to build the box and then just left this one wall open so we could put everything into the box with the heaters. Here we are building the box again, the manager was really excited when we were there about doing the work. She got a lot less excited when we left and she had to do the work by herself, but we did fully train her to use this box. And so it was really effective. So Molly kind of discussed this earlier with the sentinel bed bugs. We put bed bugs in nylon mesh and placed them in the different items. And in some of the areas where we thought they would, the temperatures would be, would have a hard time getting up to that 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So we stuffed some way down into the couch, in this laundry basket. I forget how many thermometers we had, but after the, um, the construction about, I believe it took four or five hours to get up to the temperature and maintain that temperature for a while, we were able to kill all the bed bugs in those items. So without discussing it anymore, because I know everyone's getting hungry, or if you're like me, you're getting hangry, we're going to get up and I'm actually going to ask for a few volunteers and we are going to build this heat box. So can I have about four or five volunteers? All right, got one, two, three, all right, perfect. Before you get up, though, we gotta do a stretch real quick. Okay, so we're gonna do this stretch. Hold on. I need I need you to kind of stretch like this. All right, stretch like this. Put an arm out. Take this one. Kind of stretch back. Do this. Oh yeah. I've been telling Hassie I had to get y'all to get your chomp. I'm sorry. 